Just introduce Professor Ralph Darlington, University of Salford. Ralph Sir Emeritus, yeah. Emeritus Professor of Employment Relations at Salford University, and he's published a number of books, including most recently Labour Revolt in Britain, 1910 to 1914, published by Pluto, and I did start some copies at the back that are there to um, purchase at the end of the, the session. Twelve pounds. Especially reduced price. price. Absolute bargain. Um, <coughs> Ralph's written a lot about, um, you know, JT Murphy, and he's definitely an expert on him, and he's a board member of the International Association of Strikes and Social Conflicts. Ralph, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, the thing about Murphy, of course, is that he was one of the most, he's one of that generation of worker intellectual figures. Um, that were typical of the early 20th century British labour movement and revolutionary tradition. Um, he left school at the age of 13, and like many of these activists, was a self-taught autodidact. He, he, he basically read voraciously many different types of forms of literature. Um, he got a job in the Vickers Engineering Factory in Sheffield, uh, he's actually from Sheffield, by the way, not Manchester. Um, and um, by his own account, spent a lot of his time reading revolutionary literature, Marx and Engels and so on, uh, you know, hiding behind the, the, the uh, production line so the form couldn't see him and so on, um, to develop his ideas. Um, he was an activist in the movement, you know, the engineering union. He, um, was very influenced by the movement of solidarity that was being built up in Britain at the time for the Dublin lockout of 1913. Um, heard Jim Larkin speak. He went over to Ireland and met and, and have a, a you know, long conversation with James Connolly and became profoundly influenced by the ideas of syndicalism. Of course, Connolly had just returned from America and spent quite a period, period of time working with the industrial workers of the world, the wobblers, as they were known, who advocated one big union as a form of organisation. And uh, Murphy picked up much of this and carried with that in, in his activity. And then in the war, he uh, helped develop the shop stewards' organisation within the city and led a really remarkable strike in 1917 at the Vickers Engineering Factory of 12,000 workers. It was a spectacular success. And from that, you saw the emergence of structured organisation across many of the different engineering factories in Sheffield, which then led to the formation of a workers' committee, linking up all of these structured committees. And of course, there were similar sort of developments going on in other parts of the country, in the engineering sort of areas. Because of course, because of the nature of the First World War and production and munitions being so important, um, they really became the, you know, the, the central uh, organised force inside the British working class movement. And so on the Clyde, uh, in Barrow and Furness, in Coventry, in Manchester and so on, you saw this emergent national shop stewards organisation in which there were workers' committees formed in all of these, which then linked together on a national level. And Murphy became really one of the key figures of this movement, probably its leading theorist, and it was in this time that he wrote the pamphlet in 1917, the Workers' Committee, which really became the main theoretical uh, contribution of the movement. Uh, it sold over 150,000 copies, which I can assure you, you know, that is a lot in today's world, it was considerably, you know, a high number in that, that, that period of time. And, really tried to develop, he went beyond what had been done in the pre-war syndicalist pamphlet, The Miner's Next Step, uh, produced by the Unofficial Reform Committee of the South Wales Miners Federation, which I believe is going to be the next pamphlet in the series that Strong and are doing, um, which critiqued trade union bureaucracy and advocated the need for rank and file participation in unions. What Murphy did in the Workers' Committee was both describe and elaborate what, what needed to be done, which was to set up um, rank and file forms of organisation which could challenge that bureaucracy, which could uh, challenge uh, and provide a counterweight to the constraints and conservatism of trade union officials when it came to disputes and so on. And it's an elaborate sort of organisational framework in which he talks about a network of different bodies which are essentially rank and file driven. Um, at both a local 
geographical and sort of national level, but the aim being, as I say, to, uh, to present a mechanism by which the bureaucracy could be confronted, but at the same time to advocate forms of industrial unionism and a recognition that, you know, how to best to overcome the inherent fragmentation and sectionalism of existing structures of trade unionism is to try and find ways in, in which uh, uh, the means that, that this could be, you know, could be brought together. And in a sense, you know, when you listen to Holly speaking about NHS workers saying no, you get that sense there of how to overcome the inherent sections of trolled different unions inside the NHS. And it doesn't make sense to have so, so many organisations and find ways that this can be given. I think it's fantastically important. And so Murphy develops this pamphlet. Uh, 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 in, in really sort of a novel and important way. And then after the um, Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, of course, he's then, like many other activists at the time, um, profoundly influenced by this and sees within the workers' committees which he uh, uh, experienced and, and sort of wrote about the, the potential embryonic form of an agency for revolutionary change. And subsequently, he goes to Moscow, uh, he becomes involved in the, in the revolutionary process. Uh, he returns back to Britain, becomes a founding member uh, and leading figure within the Communist Party of Great Britain, which is formed. He, you know, leads the sort of industrial department for many years and, and, and so on. I mean, just as a side, by the way, he's, his partner was a really interesting character, a woman called Molly Morris, who, when um, he was in Sheffield, uh, Murphy sort of met selling the, she was a, an organiser for the Women's Social and Political Union, the Suffragettes. She was from Manchester, actually from Salford. Uh, but she went over to, to, to Sheffield and used to sell the Suffragette inside uh, on Chapel Walk in, in Sheffield, if you know it. And Murphy spotted her and, and tried to court her, which she sort of, you know, fended off for a little while, although he bought the newspaper and was clearly interested. Um, but on his return, he went to Moscow in 1920. Um, inspired by the events in Russia, and then came back and rushed to her and sort of, in, in one fell swoop, managed to both get her to agree to marry him and also to return to Moscow with him. And you can imagine the, you know, the romantic, sort of revolutionary sort of atmosphere at the time. It's quite a nice little uh, 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 story. And one of the things I did in researching her thing was to discover that his son uh, had become a doctor in Canada. And, uh, he, he invited me over. Uh, uh, to Toronto and said, I've got this huge box underneath the bed which contains, you know, loads of documents and photos and things. Why don't you come over and, and, and have a look at it? And one of the things which I found there was an unpublished uh, autobiographical manuscript, a very autobiography uh, by Molly of her life, which we also got sort of, you know, edited and sort of published uh, with an introduction. Anyway, um, it, it, in terms of uh, the Workers' Committee pamphlet, I think it was, you know, it's probably the, one of the most important uh, revolutionary union documents which has been produced. And of course, it's 106 years old, but nonetheless, I think there are some uh, contemporary relevances to it, the ways in which people have, have mentioned, you know, Rob suggested. I mean, one of the two crucial features, I think, of the 22, 22, uh, 23 strike wave, first of all, uh, the limitations of official trade unionism, the stop, start, uh, short strike, long haul, protracted sort of, uh, you know, strategy, which has often been adopted, uh, and the willingness to advocate uh, acceptance of deals which fall well short of members' original aspirations and, and demands, um, you know, have been a characteristic sort of uh, feature, the refusal to, by and large, to have to coordinate strikes across different unions. So that, you know, you have this strike wave, but it's a very fragmented strike wave of different groups of workers going out at different times. It really doesn't make sense. So there are only a couple of occasions, 1st of February, 15th of March, when we saw workers come together and you saw the sort of power that was being generated. Um, so that has been, I think, one phenomenon of the recent strike wave. And of course, the second one is the way in which you've seen the germ, the sort of embryonic forms of rank and file organisation re emerge. And this is against the backdrop, of course, as we know, of a massive retrenchment of working class organisation. You know, huge decline of, of, of numbers of trade union uh, uh, members, of the, of the powerful shop stewards organisation of the 70s, you know, the 60s and the 70s, of course, have been considerably weakened. Uh, the dependence 
that many activists have on the official machinery has been a, a, you know, a, a very important legacy which is, has affected the movement. And I think what you've seen, though, in the strike wave is, the, is a tentative beginnings of a recovery. It hasn't transformed the situation, but you've seen some very, very significant features in the way in which it's brought trade unionism, it's brought the notion of strikes as a mechanism to fight back, right back to the, the heart of British political life. And that's having to play an important role. But I think what we've seen, more importantly, is the em is embryonic re-emergence of rank and file forms of militant, you know, uh, networks of resistance in some individual industries and unions. And of course, you know, NHS workers say no, I think it's the best example of that, spearheading the campaign over the ballot to overturn the RCM's acceptance of a terrible sort of deal. And you've seen in some other unions as well attempts to have this. And of course, it's a, a very, very, you know, tentative stage. We're not talking about powerful shop stewards organisation. The, in the case of Murphy, when he's talking about the workers' committees, were able not only to put pressure on the existing trade union uh, officials, but also be able to able and willing to act independently of them where that became necessary. Um, that doesn't really exist at the moment. But what we have, I think, is the beginnings of the possibility of trying to fan that sort of rank and file resistance. So in that sense, in those two senses, the, you know, the nature, the cautious nature of official trade unionism, the re-emergence of, of rank and file embryonic forms of resistance, I think it tells us, you know, there are echoes there which make this historical document, uh, um, you know, one which is not just of historical curiosity, but one that we can learn from for the, for, from the, you know, for COVID, for COVID time.